Paper was like gold in medieval times. I want tobacco. Sugar. That everything we thought we knew about the world might turn out to be completely wrong. All over Britain, animals are being born, rearing the next generation, from hedgehogs to great apes like these gorillas, from cats to cart horses. We'll be travelling all over the UK, following the stories of the births wherever they happen. In zoos, on farms, in people's homes, and out in the wild. We'll meet the people who are going to be responsible to make sure that they arrive safe and sound, and hopefully on time. We'll be there to witness the trials and tribulations, because as a vet, I know that not everything goes to plan. It's all right, little one. And we'll share in the joy and the heartache of Britain's never-ending animal baby boom. Coming up, we meet an orangutan family and follow the birth of new baby, Molly. And we travel to Norfolk to meet abandoned seal pups in need of some tender, loving care. This is Hula. She's a four-year-old Dalmatian. Come here, Poppet. And just a few months ago, she had a litter of puppies. Her owner's Margaret, and she's a real fanatic about Dalmatians, as I think you'll tell from her house. Come on, then. <coughs> yes, yes, I'm afraid. Nutcase, I'm afraid, yes. Yes, Dalmatians everywhere. Desperately wanted a dog as a child. Wasn't allowed to have one for a long time. Eventually, my parents gave in when I was about 13 years old. We looked in the local paper, and there was a little Dalmatian puppies, and we bought one. They're fun dogs. They're, 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 they're very active dogs. But they want to be with you, and they want to please you, and they'll do anything. Dalmatians will be happy to do anything. And here's Hula eight weeks earlier, and she's due to give birth any day now. She's been very well right the way through, so uh, fingers crossed for a nice litter. Later that night, it looks like Hula is starting to go into labour, so Margaret grabs her camera. That's the first one, having a good wash. She's nipped downstairs while I was on the phone and produced the first puppy in the cage in the hall. So I brought her back again. Nice, strong, healthy puppy. And she's giving him a darn good wash before producing the next one. It's been an hour since number one was born and she's still doing very well. Just feeding down there. I think number two is just about on the way. There, there we are, look, there's a little next one just coming out now. We'll just, just clear that face. Well, it's just gone two o'clock and I've just nipped downstairs to put the other dogs to bed and I missed number four. We've had another little dog in a few minutes. Another nice, strong puppy. Seems to be doing well. Here's the whole family 24 hours later. Hula eventually had six healthy puppies. They will stay at home until the vet gives them their jabs, but these Dalmatians will also need another type of checkup. Now, Dalmatians are well renowned for their spots. But actually, when they're born, they're purely white. The spots don't arrive for a couple of weeks. And something weird can happen with white animals. The lack of pigmentation, especially in dogs, can result in them becoming deaf. Last one in. So, six weeks later, Margaret loads the puppies into her van and heads off for a special test. By now, they have their distinctive spots. Now we're off to New the Animal Health Trust at Newmarket for the official hearing test today. Uh, it's a quite a good 120 miles away, it's taken about two and a half hours. 20 years ago we were getting one or two that were deaf in one ear, the occasional deaf one. 
These days, touch wood, I've had six consecutive litters so far with no deafness at all, so we are, we are succeeding in breeding it out, I think. Hi there. What have you got? Just six, just six this time. Hello. Put Mum and Dad for the ride. Oh, aren't they bonny? Gosh, they're beautiful. So the poppies don't wriggle and squirm during the test. First, they're given a bit of playtime. Then, a big meal. And that sets them up for 40 winks. Margaret wants to keep one of the puppies for herself. The others she hopes to place with people who've been waiting for a puppy from this litter. But if any of them do prove to be deaf, Margaret will have to find the right family to take them on. Being deaf isn't the end of the world for a dog, but if you're thinking of taking a deaf dog on, there are some special considerations you need to have. Obviously, you have to be very careful around traffic, and it's not going to respond to voice commands, so you have to learn some form of sign language. I think we might be ready. Probably be Chardonnay. Well, the machine itself that we use is actually a, a people machine. We've just sort of like commandeered it from human medicine. We actually use tiny little like acupuncture needles, which we just slip under the, the skin of the head, place the headphone against the ear, set the machine going, and what you want to see is a series of peaks and troughs, and what you don't want to see is actually a flat line because basically that means that, unfortunately, that particular ear is deaf. All right, baby. Good girl. Good boy. Good boy. All right, baby. Try. It's an anxious half hour for Margaret, as one after another, her pups are tested. It's five down and just the last puppy to go. It's very laid back, this one. You never know. Good boy. All right, baby. Good boy. But at the end of the test, it's good news. All the pups have passed with flying colours. Now Margaret has to decide where the others are going and choose one for herself. This is Sherry. She's going fairly locally. Somebody who's had one of mine before. This little spotty one, very naughty. It's going to be called Boo Boo. Now, this little chap's going to Boston to a friend who's had Dalmatians before. Now, this little chap is going to a lady who's Portuguese down in the Midlands. And this is Chardonnay. I don't know what his pet name's going to be just yet. He's not going far away. Right, last but not least, this is the one I think is going to stay. Now, this is Pino, and he's going to be a show dog and a stud dog, so wish me luck. <laughs> this is Pino today, 15 weeks old and growing real strong. He's doing really well, so I'm going to leave him with Margaret. She's going to take them all for a big, long walk. And I have got an appointment with my next animal, and it's one of my favourites. It's orangutans, and I love orangutans. They are so cute and very, very cheeky. I've spent a lot of time with them out in Borneo, but I'm heading out to Twycross, where they've got an amazing orangutan family to see how they cope with another little baby in their midst. Meet Dad Batu, Mum Malaku, baby Molly, and her older sister, Miri. All the members of this Bornean orangutan family were born in the UK and are part of an endangered species breeding programme and their keeper is Tanya. There's two sorts. We've got Bornean and, and Sumatran. We've got Bornean here. And, and obviously, there's not many left in the wild at all now due to the deforestation and the pet trade. Tanya has a particularly close bond with eight-year-old Miri, as she's cared for her since birth. However, the time has now come for Miri to leave to start her own family at a zoo in Germany. It's time for her to go, because she's eight. So she needs to go make her own family somewhere else, really. Miri has been allowed to stay an extra year so she can learn maternal behaviour by watching Mum with her new baby, Molly. Orangutans have a very long childhood. It's second only to man. It's around about seven, eight years where they would spend with Mum. And at the end of that period, they would be expected to move away and actually form their own territories. So that's what they tend to mimic here at the zoo. But in this instance, because her mum was pregnant, they allowed Miri to stay for one more year so she could witness the birth and learn those essential maternal skills. It seems to be working, and Miri keeps a close eye on her little sister Molly and even helps mum with nursing duties. Molly was actually born a year ago, and thankfully Tanya had her camcorder ready. 
and you can see that Mary was right there, front row seat and heavily involved. Because as I say, Miri was there. She saw the whole process. Didn't understand it all, and she could. She kept looking and, and all that sort of thing. And then afterwards, the baby came out and she cried. Whoa! It's nice that she's seen all that. Orangutans are the slowest of all primates to breed. On average, they'll only have a baby every eight years. So this birth is incredibly exciting. After 18 months of helping to raise Molly, the family is very close, so leaving is going to be particularly difficult. And not just for Miri, it's also going to be hard for Tanya, who's cared for Miri for the past eight years. She's got a massive, lovely, brand new enclosure to go into as well, with two others, uh, a male and a female, about the same age, which she needs now. She's stuck with ours, which they're OK, but they're a bit old and they don't really want to play. So people her own age, it'll be amazing. We've been following Miri the orangutan as she learns how to be a mother by watching her mum rear her younger sister, Molly. But the day has come for Miri to leave, to join her new family at Rostock Zoo in Germany. Miri knows something's up. She's been separated from her mum and her sister. The vet arrives to sedate her and give her a final health check before she hits the road. This is the age that she would naturally leave her mum and go and find a partner of her own. So we've been very careful to plan that for this age. It's great that she's been able to see her mum rear this youngster to a certain age as well. So that was really important for Miri to see that happen. So today I performed full clinical examination under anaesthetic and did general body weight and body measurements to make sure that we've got all the information that we need so I can say, yes, she's healthy, she looks great, she can go. Good, Bennett. Little fatty. It is traumatic for both of us, really, because she's never known any difference and I haven't either. But then we are, you know, for conservation, we need these programmes to, to sort of happen. From when she was tiny to when she is now, to see all the steps and she's getting her own family and things, it's, it's, it's amazing. Tanya is making the 800-mile journey alongside Miri and will stay with her in Germany for a week to settle her in. Miri will be joining a small breeding group of one male bred at Rostock and one female from a zoo in Dorset. It is mixed emotions. You know it's got to happen and you know it's for the best. Because for us, as from Tricross, because we're quite successful in breeding them, for us to, to sort of carry on the breeding programme and be part of it is really good. And to know that I've been part of it and got her to eight years old, it makes me quite proud. Like a proud mother, I suppose, aren't I? <laughs> it's been four weeks since the move, so I've come back to Twycross to see how it went. How are you doing, Tanya? Hi. So okay. she settled in OK? Very well. Oh, yes. very good. Oh, OK. Yes, very she... well. She met her girlfriend partner there yeah. the same day. Right. And I think the next day we put the mail in. Oh, you mean that you move, mix them together? Yes, so they're all integrated now, all settled. There was a few slaps and yeah, things, which yeah, is yeah. around world, you yes, know. Yes, exactly, yeah. And how has it been here? Obviously, it must have been difficult here. It's been very difficult here, very. Yeah. It's taken us all this time, which is over a month, mm. to start building the trust back up with Malika, which is Miri's mum. Yeah. Because she's still a bit wary and nervous. But yeah. it must be traumatic to, to see them go. Yeah, and she was also babysitter. <laughs> so she had a bit of free time. Now she's like, oh, I've got to do it all myself now. Yeah, it sounds very, yeah. very similar to the human world. Yes, oh, yeah, very much so, yeah. I'm so happy it's gone so well here. Orang babies don't come around that often, obviously, so when they do, it's a real treat for everybody involved. Here you go, big man. And hopefully, it'll continue being as successful as it's been, but I'm afraid Tanya's gonna have to wait another eight years for another baby to play with. Our final destination today is the east coast of Norfolk. 
And our next animal is still a mammal, but one that prefers to live in water. This is the wide, flat vastness of Norfolk's coast, where the aptly named wash sweeps the seawater in and out daily. Forklift truck driver Mark Alsop likes to walk along the Norfolk coast. One morning when out on the mudflats of the wash, he made a startling discovery. I didn't see the seal. He, he, he must have been right next to where I was walking. He was sat on the rocks. I wasn't really sure what to do. The seal was struggling. He, he couldn't really move on the rocks. I just managed to pick him up, slung him on my shoulder, put him in the car, took him home. Put him in the bath, window open, and I rang uh, the Sea Life Centre. They said keep him nice and cool. That's where he stayed till they came. Manning the phones that day was Sea Life Sanctuary Manager Nigel Crowsdale. Every year at this June, July time of the year is when the pups start to be born. And we pick up the phone and it will be someone on a beach somewhere saying, I've come across a little tiny seal pup. What do, what do I do? Um, if the pup needs rescuing, we bring it into the sanctuary. We have a purpose-built hospital for them where the staff can give them care and attention with the objective by the end of the year, we get them to a certain weight, we tag them and they go back to the wild. Normally, seal rescues take place at the beach, but this time, Holly Stallworthy was in for a bit of a surprise. I've never made a house call to a seal call-out in my entire career here. Uh, it was definitely the most unusual call-out I've ever had. Yeah, you put it in the bath. That's the best place for a seal pup. If you were to put a seal pup in your house, it's the best place uh, for a seal pup to be in a bathtub. It's nice and contained, and it can easily be cleaned. After a full checkup, the bathtub pup is put in an observation tank so staff can keep a close eye on her. But then Mark Alsop phones again. He's found another washed up seal. And this time it looks serious. The rescue team head out to the coast to find the stranded pup. Seal pups can die within hours of being abandoned by their mums, so it's important for the rescuers to get to them as soon as possible. But this is not an easy place to work in. The sea can be a very dangerous place. The rescuers never quite know what to expect. They could be fighting against tides and sinking sand and difficult to reach locations. It's got to be a stretch of jobby. The seal pup is over a mile from the water's edge and the rescue team are going to have to work quickly to stop her from dehydrating in the exposed conditions. Right. Hello. He's obviously very skinny. You can see his hip bones just behind him here. Uh, he's got no tears. It shows that he's quite dehydrated. This time of year, they'll probably be about two to three weeks old, so he'll still be living off of his mother. So we're going to have to take this one back to the sanctuary and uh, start him on his rehabilitation. OK, it's a very good sign that he's showing that he's very snappy. OK. Holly keeps the seal calm by covering the new pup's head. OK, I've got him secure. I'm just going to move him over to the stretcher. The frightened pup could bite his rescuers if left uncovered. Seals might look cute and cuddly, but remember they are wildlife. They will give you a nasty nip if you get too close. They do have really sharp teeth and lots of bacteria inside their mouth, so it's a good idea to keep a very, very good safe distance away from the seal. Thank you very much, Mark. Let's take him back. Back at the rescue center, the pup is given a full checkup. All right, all right. Oh, very skinny. I can feel her hips here. There's no obvious signs of swelling along the backbone here. He was fed and put into an observation tank so his progress could be monitored. Although the pup showed no signs of external injury, he was suffering from an internal infection. Despite two visits from the vet and a course of strong antibiotics, the seal pup couldn't shake off the infection and passed away in the night. The sanctuary rang Mark and told him the sad news, but he was still keen to bring his kids to visit the bathtub pup he rescued, since named Jessica Jane. And she surfaces to greet them right on cue. There we go. Right there. Aww. Jessie Jane. Hello. Hello. There you go. 
you see her? She's yeah. looking really well. She is, yeah. Very fat, isn't she? She's got a good yeah. layer of blubber on her. She's a lot bigger. I wouldn't have recognised her. Even the, the face looks different. Oh, everything all just fattened up. She looks wonderful. How old is Jessie? Jessica Jane, uh, she would have been born June this year. So she's about two, three months old now. There you go. Can you see her there? She keeps coming over to have a look, doesn't she? Next stage for her, we're basically fattening her up, ready for when she goes back into the wild. She's also interacting with all the other pups, learning how to be a wild seal again, building on her stamina, swimming around, and, uh, and then we will release her. Find you. This way. As soon as Jessica Jane reaches the ideal weight of 30 kilos, she'll be ready to be released back into the sea. Like these two rescued seal pups, Dempsey and Daly. They're all a very healthy weight, nice and chunky. They've got good reserves, so they're going to be fine out there even if they don't catch fish for their first couple of days. And releasing them together gives them a little bit of company. Roly poly. Flippers. OK, so up. This is why we do the job, and the release is definitely the best bit. Clip. We want to see them go. Oh. <laughs> We're up. Daly's my personal favourite. When I picked him up, he was so small. And we had him in the hospital for quite a while, just trying to get him to pool feed. And now getting to release him really has just made my year this year for the pup season. Oh, he's swinging. <laughs> OK, so we're going to open this one and just pull it back and lay it down and step round the back of him. She's got a clear route to go. Thanks for visiting. There they go. Perfect weather conditions, a little bit of breeze, nice and sunny, nice and hot. Go out into the wash where they'll find the seal colony out on seal sands and can start their new life.